and hesitate over every word. They're intentional. Even the ones that aren't there are intentional. And the ones, the one that we find not very present in the first few chapters is God's name himself. It's used very sparingly to, to cast a great shadow over these opening chapters of Exodus. And it wants you to live in that shadow for a period of time with Israel. Yesterday, we were privileged to go to a play near Chicago. And in that play, it was of the uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, me and the three boys. And as we're sitting there, the, the, the stage is dark, the curtains are drawn, the room is dark, the lights are very low lit. And as we're sitting there, Bo quickly leans over, Dad, I saw somebody walk backstage. In the midst of this darkness, he was excited by a sign of life. That meant more was coming of that life. And that's essentially the picture I want you to have of Israel in the darkness looking for any sign of life. That's the state that they're in right now. And so before I go any further in this text, I want you to observe your life for a moment. And I want you to consider what, what dark situation do you find yourself in right now that can correlate to any degree, greater or lesser, to what Israel is experiencing here? Where do you fear the absence of God in your life? You not conquering the temptation that you have? Are you not conquering the temptation to anxiety and fear given a situation you find yourself in? Do you find yourself losing, losing, losing with no hope of anything looking up in life? Broken relationship. Broken kids. Broken body. Broken country. Where is it that you feel in the dark. Because wherever that is, the more you are familiar with it right now, the more you will hear from God from his text this morning. This is not a history book that's meant to stay history. This is a history book that's meant to affect you right now in this moment. And so the more familiar you are with your pain right now, the more you'll derive from a book that's meant to minister to your pain right now. So don't arrogantly say, well, my situation is not even close to as bad as Israel's. You're right. It's probably not. But as Mark Twain said, according to the theory of relativity, a king losing his crown is just as bad for a little girl losing her doll. So whatever you find yourself in, whatever you've lost, whatever you're struggling with, allow the text this morning to comfort you because the Spirit intends that it does so. Don't be above that. Enter into it. And in order to enter into it, I want to invite you into an incredible interpretational dilemma. I want you to sit with Ben Lovelady on Monday and Tuesday and on through the week as I study this text and am encountering a very difficult text to interpret. You're like, that seemed pretty straightforward to me. So let me ask you. Now, I don't want any raise of hands yet, but I am going to ask for a raise of hands. So you cowards, begin working with your hearts right now. <laughs> I want to introduce the dilemma like this. Was Moses 
killing of the Egyptian a good thing or a bad thing? I want you to think about that. I'm going to walk you through how difficult of a decision that is if you think it's very easy to make. But I want you to think about that. And then when I'm done presenting both sides, I'm going to ask you to vote. Was Moses' killing of the Egyptian a good thing or a bad thing? If it was a good thing, which let me tell you that commentators are on both sides of the fence here. Lots of them think it was good. Lots of them think it was bad. If it was a good thing, if you're sitting here thinking it was a good thing, he did the right thing. Why does the text tell you that he looked this way and that? Now, it could be argued, as some do, that take this as a good thing, that in the prophets there's a passage where God looks this way and that to see if there's anybody that's going to do the right thing in a bad situation. No one does, and so God acts. So, was Moses looking... Is anybody going to do anything? Nobody's doing anything. He steps up and he kills the Egyptian. Fair enough. Then I have to ask, if you think it was a good thing, and that's what Moses was doing, which is possible, why does he bury the body so quickly? Now, if it was a good thing, you also need to understand, if you take that view Him going to the wilderness for 40 years was not for his training by God as much as it was a first 40 years of wilderness for Israel, right? Because Israel will spend 40 years in the wilderness for them not believing God was going to rescue them like he was going to do with Jericho. So if Moses killed the Egyptian, he should have. He comes the next day. He breaks up a fight between two Hebrews. They say, who are you to break up a fight against us? Who died and made you king? Are you going to kill us too like you did the Egyptian? Moses says, okay, they're not supportive of the cause. I'm gone. And God has him gone for 40 years. So him leaving in the sense that it was a good thing to kill the Egyptian was a 40 years of judgment on Israel for not believing Moses was their rescuer by God. But this is a bit of a stretch because what we find is that Moses becomes a shepherd in Midian. And as a shepherd in Midian, he joins the ranks of men like Jacob and David in the future. So it seems a bit preparatory for Moses to be a shepherd in the wilderness for 40 years, especially because God will refer to himself as shepherding them out of, out of Egypt and through the wilderness. And so being a shepherd seems to be a training ground for Moses. So that's a stretch for that position. Now, I've dealt with those who think it was a good thing. Those are, the, those are the hurdles you have to jump to stay saying it was a good thing. Now I want to talk to those who think it was a bad thing, that Moses should not have killed the Egyptian like he did. The text in Exodus, in the Hebrew, uses the exact same word for what the Egyptian was doing to the Hebrew as for what Moses did to the Egyptian. So, it seems to suggest that Moses did not go overboard in what he did to the Egyptian. He simply did to the Egyptian, Lex Telianus sort of way, a eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, blow for blow. Egyptians killing the, the Israelite. Moses sees it, kills the Egyptian. Justice, it seems an even-handed penalty for what the Egyptian was doing to the Hebrew. If you think it's a bad thing what Moses did to the Egyptian, you also have to face the fact that the word for struck, Moses struck the Egyptian, is the same word that will be used for what God does to Egypt. 
So it seems as though Moses' heart was in line with God's in striking the Egyptian because God himself will strike the Egyptian. More than that, when we get to the book of Acts, which is the place where we learn Moses was 40 when this happened, and educated by the Egyptians, we learn that from Stephen's speech when he's standing before the high priest and the council, right before Stephen himself is stoned, he gives a recounting of Israel's history. And I want you to listen to the way that Stephen looks back on what Moses did. Of all the things Stephen could talk about, he chooses to talk about Moses killing the Egyptian. And in the short space that he has before his death, he chooses that this is an important story to tell. Fascinating. We'll find, out, we'll find out why in a bit. But listen to Stephen's recounting of this tale. If you think Moses killing the Egyptian was a bad thing. Listen to what Stephen says. Acts 7, to 29. And Moses, Stephen says, was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. So, if you believe that Moses killing the Egyptian was a bad thing, you have to deal with these things, and you'd also likely say that Moses going into the wilderness was a preparatory time for Moses. He needed, edu- he needed educated by God. He needed trained, disciplined by God in a way that he didn't have previously, and so he needed those 40 years in the wilderness. Are you ready? Okay, now raise them, raise them nice and high. We don't want any shyness going on here. We want full committal here, okay? <laughs> I love it, I love it. So, Was Moses' killing of the Egyptian a good thing or a bad thing? Who thinks it was a good thing? Raise them high. Who thinks it was a bad thing? Raise them high. You know, you know. Moses was educated in the way of Egyptians. You've been educated in the way of Pastor Love Lady. So I saw a lot of hands up on both of them. (laughs) He's trained you well. Because I personally believe if I were sitting in the congregation this morning, my hand would be up for both as well. (laughs) In In order to draw you into it, I need it to just be two options. Now, I'm going to have three points from here on out in seeking to answer that question. Was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? And those three points are going to be, in reference to Moses, his people, his killing, and his deliverer. His people, his killing, and his deliverer. So let's talk first about his people. We begin in the text this morning, and the text tells us two times, which again, Moses is a Harvard grad. He doesn't write things twice when he doesn't need to. And he begins by telling us two times 
that Moses went out to his people. Which is very significant. Because what he's tracking is he's tracking the evolution of a man, of a prince of Egypt that grew up in Pharaoh's household. And now the narrator is telling you that Moses considers the Israelites his people. That's huge. We know that he's dressed in the garb of an Egyptian because when he gets to Midian, uh, Reuel's daughters, which we'll come to know as Jethro, Reuel is, is likely a clan name for Jethro, and Jethro is his personal name. But Jethro's daughters see him, and when they come back and say, this guy rescued us from the other shepherds, they say, he says, who was he? He said, he was an Egyptian. So Moses looks like an Egyptian. But what we're finding in the text is that he's going out to what is now called his people. One commentator put it this way, just as Moses was trained in the way of the Egyptians, it appears by virtue of him referring to his people as his people twice, he also was trained in Israel's school as well. Where did that happen? Well, if Jochebed had Moses for three to four years, which was generally the time of nursing in that day, she would have had Moses until he was at least four years old potentially even a little bit older. He would have been with his mom. He would have been with his dad, Amram. In fact, when Moses is encountered by God at the burning bush, God will say to him, he'll introduce himself to him and say, I am the God of your father. So Moses somehow, from that time at a young age, or if he continued to visit his family on occasion, or had a relationship with his sister, Miriam, that he became familiar with Israel's God. And he, in his heart of hearts, began associating with their God. Throughout the years, we've got some people sitting in the auditorium in the congregation who were brought to church. Becky's mom was one of them. Brought to church by families that live on their street or in their neighborhood. Their families don't go to church. They don't have a relationship with God. But someone in this church, even right now or in times past, has faithfully picked them up as a young child and brought them to church. And some of those people sitting here right now look at this church as closer to being their blood relatives, their heart relatives, than even their blood relatives. So Moses grew up in Pharaoh's home, but his heart was being mended to God's people in God's time. So he looked like an Egyptian, but that was just the exterior. It wasn't showing what was going on inside Moses' heart. The text communicates, he walks out and he looks upon the, the pain that Israel is enduring at the hand of the Egyptians. And the word that's used for look upon is a word that in the, in the Old Testament has emotional involvement. It's not just an observation. He's not just like a, a journalist going to track a story in some other country with really no heart connection to what's going on. This word is used when Hagar is with Ishmael out in the wilderness and they're going to die. And it says she, she, she left Ishmael as a young boy away so she could go somewhere else so that she didn't have to look upon him dying. In other words, there's great emotional involvement in her looking upon Ishmael. She's attached to her boy's coming death. That's, that's the word used in a negative emotional experience, but it's also used in a positive in the prophets. This word is used for the watchman that's waiting for God to come to rescue Israel. And when the watchman sees, looks upon God's arrival, he's exuberant with joy. So it's, it's a looking upon that's either sad for what's going on or incredibly joyous, like the arrival of the bridegroom. 
And this is the word that's used to describe Moses looking upon the suffering of Israel. It's an, it's an entering into it. It's a compassion. It's a sympathetic. It's a, it's a I'm feeling the whips myself as I watch this. I'm wincing at the blows. I'm familiar with the dust, with the parched mouth, and the inability to take a break. I'm familiar with that. And this is absolutely sensational that Moses is doing this. Because ancient documentation tells us that as they study ancient Egyptian curriculum, these students were trained to deplore manual labor, to hate it, to despise it. We learned from Genesis that to be a shepherd was an abomination to Egypt. These were people that to be dusty would be to be absolutely Filthy to have dust on your body. They valued learning. So for Moses to come here and associate his heart with these people is a totally supernatural ordeal. One of the sayings in the ancient Egyptian documents for praising having high status was this, and I quote, you call for one, a thousand answer you. You stride freely on the road. You will not be like a hired ox. You are in front of the others. This is what was drilled in to the Egyptian students. And for Moses to completely turn a 180 and walk out and look upon his kinsmen's suffering and experience it with them, such a change, such an incredible change. I want you to imagine that you fly like the rest of us, economy. And so you're used to getting on the plane and walking through the first class spot, and, and they're all there ahead of time. They've all got their laptops open, their phones out. They've got their drinks and their treats that they get ahead of time before you, whatever. And I want, you to, I want you just to imagine that you arrive, you check in, and they say, you know, you've been bumped to first class. So you'll be seated very shortly. And you sit down. And you begin looking around. And already your sinful heart begins telling you, you know, you kind of are more important than all these other people. <laughs> they call first class. You stand up. You look around. You walk into first class. This whole time, you've been wondering what these people's occupations are. Who do they know? How much money do they make? And now everybody's wondering that about you. And you kind of accept it a little bit. They are wondering. I'm really glad they don't know, but they are wondering. <laughs> this was the way Moses was raised. He was the first class. And Moses got up and he walked to economy. And he didn't walk grudgingly. He walked gladly. The text is so significant when it says he went out to his people. Do you know that that Hebrew phrase is the exact same Hebrew phrase that will be used when Israel went out from Egypt? Philip Ryken puts it this way. There seems to be a connection Catch this, so significant. Before Israel could go out of Egypt, Moses needed to go out of Egypt, emotionally, if not yet physically. There was an inner transformation that Moses stood up in his first class, and he looked around, and he said, I don't, I don't want this anymore. Because this doesn't have the God of my Father. 
This, these are not my people. I don't feel you anymore. I don't feel kinsmen with you anymore. I, I feel this with the people whose God is the true God, no matter what their condition. I want them. I want to be ranked, not demoted. I want to, I want to be ranked with them. It's a higher ranking. They're in the presence of the God most high. That's where I want to be. It's not a step down. It's an escalated position. I shared with the folks in the new members class that a man who's impacted me greatly in my life named Jerry Karen, and he's a bivocational pastor, and he's a custodian at a high school. And he shared with me one time, he said, Ben, it was such an awesome story. He said, I'm sitting there before work started, and everybody's, all the, all the uh, custodial staff's talking about different things, and this conversation got started of the famous people that individuals have met. And so it starts going from a one-upsmanship to, I met this person, I met this person, I met this person. And Jerry says, I can beat you all. He says, I want you guys to know that this very morning, I had a personal talk with the creator of this world. This is where The author of Hebrews dances a spiritual jig when he looks back on this text in Exodus 2. Moses going out to his people, going out of Egypt to his people. And he writes this in Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. Think of that. The Apostle Paul will say something very similar. He says, I want to experience the suffering of Christ because, catch this, Christ is so high that suffering for him outranks, suffering outranks the pleasure of the world's mighty. Consider that. That suffering for Jesus, because of his highness, is of higher value than than living in the highest penthouses in the entire world. Knowing the most famous people with the biggest income. Jesus is so valuable that suffering is of greater value than those things that the world can offer, which Moses had. David Livingston, in traveling to Africa as a missionary, going to minister and share the gospel with the African people, He arrived, and to his chagrin, he found that the missionaries there never made it past the coast of Africa to the inland of Africa. They lived in beautiful houses along the coast, and would you believe that they had African slaves? The missionaries. David Livingston arrives He sees this hoax, this joke, and he quickly divorced himself from those so-called missionaries, and he, with two other African friends, began journeying into the inland of Africa, where he would die, never retreating. In fact, there was a a newspaper uh, organization in the States that at that time, believe it or not, the America was, was interested in the welfare of a missionary. Imagine that. But they were. In fact, they were so interested that the owner of this newspaper commissioned 2,000 people to go to Africa and find Livingston because they hadn't heard from him in years. And he says, if you can find him, we will sell and sell and sell and sell because the American people are so interested in seeing if Livingston's still alive. By the time they reached Livingston, 
54 of the 2,000 were still alive. They found him. It's the famous scene. They walk into the hut where Livingston is sick near death. And the gentleman said, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Found him. He's on the brink of death. He begged him to come back to the States. To come back. Livingston would not retreat. Nursed him back to health. And the best Livingston did was he gave him his letters. He gave him his documents. And they sold and sold and sold. But Livingston died in Africa. And his two dearest friends, who were Africans themselves, took out his physical heart. And they buried it next to a tree in Africa. And they sent his body home because they said his heart is here. This is Moses. This is Moses. He's got every reason to stay safe. But he wants, he desires to be associated with the lowly people of God. Jesus will say something very similar to us. And he'll say, friends, 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 when you throw a party, don't don't throw a party for those that can pay you back. You identify those that cannot pay you back, and you throw a party for them. If you want to be like Christ, you associate with the lowly. You minister to their hearts and you count it a joy. You count it a privilege. A privilege to wash feet. So, this is Moses. This is who he is. And he is praiseworthy in this identification with the Hebrews. Now let's get to the second point, his killing. As I mentioned earlier, The same word for the Egyptian striking the Israelite is the same word that's used of Moses striking the Egyptian. Some question whether this was premeditated murder or Moses in the fury of the fight killed him. Not on purpose, just like manslaughter. I choose, as I understand the text, that this was an intentional killing because the Egyptian was intentionally killing the Hebrew. So I believe that in many ways, Moses assessing the situation and striking the Egyptian was very much of heart with God who would later strike the Egyptians. Believe that Moses was just in his understanding of the recognition that this Egyptian should die. That was just. He had a proper understanding of this Egyptian's situation. I also believe that the text leaves us on shaky ground with the actual murder, killing of the Egyptian. When the text says he looks this way and that, it's possible that he means that like God, he's looking to see if there's going to be a rescuer. I personally do not take that I think the immediacy of burying the body puts this whole situation suspect. As well-meaning and as well-informed as Moses was in assessing it, I believe this situation's on shaky ground. I believe that the narrative wants you to feel the profound weakness of Moses' rescue, which will later be contrasted with God's coming rescue. Once you, I think the narrator wants you to see Moses' action and see, the empty, see how it's empty of divine power. It's got poor timing. There's a lack of divine commission. Moses is aware. I believe that Moses is probably aware that God is doing something amazing in his heart and mind. And he's headed in the right trajectory. I think that's where Stephen's speaking from. But there was not yet a divine full commission like we'll see in Exodus 3. I would personally put this in the category of things like in Genesis where 
Abraham goes to Egypt in the famine, or uh, how he handled Sarah with Pharaoh and Abimelech, or him taking Hagar, you notice that in each one of these events, he had God's, God's heart on the matter. God did not intend for Abraham to die in Egypt. God did not want Sarah to get harmed by other men. God wanted Abraham and Sarah to have a son, but he didn't want it to happen Abraham's way. He wanted it to happen his way. So Abraham going to Egypt was wrong in the end. Abraham lying about Sarah to Pharaoh and Abimelech was wrong. Him taking Hagar was wrong. Just so, I believe, Moses slaying the Egyptian, God wanted to liberate Israel, but not through vigilante justice. In a similar vein, I remember reading an account of a man who killed an abortion doctor and was on sentence for death, was interviewed. As the story goes, in the interview, and I paraphrase, they said, why did you do what you did? He said, on average, this abortion doctor, the most popular in the area, killed between X and X amount of babies each day. I arrived at his work. I knew he was going in to kill somewhere between this amount and this amount, according to his average. I sat in my car. I knew he'd have two bodyguards. I waited to the appropriate time, stepped out of my car, and shot him in the chest with my sawed-off shotgun. They said, would you do it again in a heartbeat? Now, how do we handle this situation? Say what you will about the Holocaust and its six million. Judge Germany like you will and should. Consider our country that since Roe v. Wade has faced the death, the silent death, of over 60 million babies in many of our lifetimes. Those deaths had taken place our very lifetimes. What do we say about that? What will our future children and their children say about our time in the hope and prayer that eventually abortion sees its end in America? What will we say? Well, should we, like this individual, take matters into our own hands, clearly murdering innocent, helpless victims? I believe the answer is no. That what we do is we partner with God, and we do everything we can in partnering with God to bring God to overturn this catastrophic decision. Should we hate it? Should we deplore it? Should we yearn for justice? Think all those things have a proper place as well as praying for the redemption of abortion doctors. But I don't believe it's proper to step into the way of taking matters into our own hands. And for that reason, I think what this individual did was wrong and did not please God. We see in Moses a strain for justice, a yearning for justice. We don't just see it in him slaying the Egyptian, which God understands as just because he'll do it himself. It's a matter of timing and of partnership with God. We see that Moses has a heart for justice. The very next day he comes out, he sees two Hebrews fighting, and a legal term is used that Moses diagnosed which one was actually in the wrong, and he addresses him, and he's saying, why are you doing this? In other words, Moses has a a brain that splits the atom, to to borrow a pastor's phrase, of of recognizing what's just and what's unjust. He addresses the one in the wrong. Doesn't just stop there. 
Moses goes on as he flees to Midian, and he ends up at a well, not the first patriarch to end up at a well. And as he's at the well, he again settles the matter that these women, uh, Jethro's daughters, arrived first, likely, but the shepherds come, and after they've got their water for their animals, they run them off and then steal their water. It seems to be a daily occurrence because Jethro says, why are you back so early? Moses sees this, and being alone, he handles these other shepherds. So Moses is demonstrating time and time and time again that he has a heart for justice that God's created within him. And I personally believe that this is the the standpoint from which Stephen is speaking. Stephen is standing before the high priest, he's standing before the council, and he knows that he's probably going to be stoned to death in a very short amount of time. And he says to them, do you want to know something? God was clearly at work in Moses. It's a little question that a guy that grew up in Pharaoh's household and leaves that place, leaves the White House as it were, one of Donald Trump's children to go work with poverty is, is supernatural. You as well as I know that something was special in what Moses did, even to the point of risking his own life in, in trying to right a wrong. And do you know that from that very day where you should have observed that something was going on with Moses, you drove him out of town then, And then, we've got Jesus. And Jesus, like Moses, but I would argue even better with no sin, of course, comes in, and and you hear smells of liberation again in Jesus. And guess what you do to him? The same thing. Like with Moses, Numbers, as they go into the wilderness, one of the very near episodes in Numbers of them starting in the wilderness is they complain against Moses and against God that they don't have water. And then, interestingly, at the end of the wilderness watering, uh, wanderings, they have the same problem. They don't have water, and they argue against Moses and against God. And I think that that is the narrator's way of saying, do you want to know what the wilderness period looked like for the majority? Unbelief. For the majority, it looked like unbelief all through Israel's history. And Stephen says, so you didn't see God's hand in Moses, and I would argue according to my view, albeit imperfectly, you didn't see God's hand in Moses, you didn't see God's hand in Jesus, and it's very likely that you won't see God's hand in me. And they say, you're right, grab your stones everybody. That's the place I think Stephen is speaking from. My last point. Talked about Moses' people. We've talked about Moses' killing. And now we will talk about Moses' deliverer. Because I believe that is the whole point of this text. Maybe the strongest argument for my position, which is a bit of a both-and position. There were good things to what Moses was doing and, and what he was thinking, and there was bad things in what he was doing. This passage reads, and it starts with Moses going out of Egypt to look upon Israel's plight. And this passage wraps up with God looking upon Moses' plight. It's the same word. See, what I believe that Moses is doing is he's contrasting himself in seeing Israel and trying to handle Israel with God seeing Israel and beginning to handle Israel. There's a contrast. That if this exodus is going to work, it will not be on the shoulders of peddly Moses. It will be on the shoulders of God himself. You watch Moses rescue people his way, it looks like him turning tail and and running and ducking into Israel, or into Midian. 
You look at God's way of handling Israel. It looks at them marching triumphantly out of Egypt with Egypt themselves throwing jewelry and money and possessions upon them. There's two vastly different ways to leave Egypt. Moses leaves his way when he does it his way. Israel leaves God's way when they experience God's rescue. When you just observe the text, you find that in verses 11 through 15a, which talk about Moses, of, of the 16 verbs that are used in the Hebrew, 14 of them apply to Moses. So verses 11 through 15a are all about Moses. But then you get to verses 23 to 25, and there is a five Fold reference to God in those two verses. I believe that's very significant in the narrative art. That the, the narrator who is Moses is telling you, this is all about me and how I handle things and how it turned out. This is all about God and how he handled things and how it will turn out. Watch God. Don't watch me. The text reads, during those many days in Exodus 2, 23 to 25, The king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. History tells us that whenever a pharaoh died, it was tradition for the new pharaoh to release all the prisoners, and all the slaves. I don't know if you've ever been in a position in life, maybe at your workplace, in your marriage, with your kids, with your friends, where you were expecting something. Now, expectations are never good. You're very likely making an idol out of something when you begin expecting something. But let's say you do. And you're expecting something big time. Like, can't wait for it. And you get home, or you get with your friend, or you get to the workplace, and the moment of expectation has arrived, and you arrive, and nothing. Zero. Nobody even knows what you were thinking. It's not even on anybody's radar. And it was like as big as this church in your mind. It's exactly what Israel experienced. They're likely counting down the days for Pharaoh's death because they know that when that happens, as tradition has it, we will be released. Finally, he dies. Nothing. Zero. The Pharaoh continues it. This is where they're at. And what they do in that moment is they pray. Commentators question, are they just groaning? Are they just crying? Are they really, really praying? Well, Deuteronomy tells us that as the fathers tell their sons what happened in the Exodus, they say when this happened, we cried out to God. So I believe they did pray. They weren't just moaning. They were praying. And isn't it fascinating That it's in response to their prayer that God hears, that God sees, that God comes down, that God experiences the sorrow with them. Isn't that fascinating? Because in Genesis 15, God said to Abraham that your children will suffer in Egypt for 400 years. So it was already predetermined how long they'd suffer in Egypt And yet, the text tells us that it was in response to their prayer that God acted. Isn't that interesting? One person said it this way, and maybe you're familiar with the phrase, that sometimes the world's largest doors turn, swing on the smallest hinges. Sometimes the world's largest doors swing on the smallest hinges. And as God would have it, even in His sovereignty... He chooses to move into Israel's exodus 
in answer to prayer. We find something very similar in the New Testament where in Malachi, John the Baptist has already prophesied he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And yet we find that Gabriel, in speaking to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he, he comes to him and he says, your prayers have been answered. Your wife Elizabeth will be with child. She'll bear a son. So, and then we find Galatians 4.4 4, that Jesus was born at the exact appropriate time. The fullness of time had come. In other words, the clock was going and it was, God was waiting for it to get to a certain hour hand, minute hand, second hand. The moment it got to the second hand, Jesus was coming. And yet, it all seems to have been enacted through prayer. So, that leads me to believe that God sovereignly plans your and my prayers. I don't abandon the sovereignty of God. I just say that the sovereignty of God has established my prayer. So, when I feel an inclination to pray, what should I do? Pray. Because you know what? I've done that, and I've seen answers to prayer, and it's blown my mind. I love the experience. So pray. It's part of God's plan. So in the end, when we evaluate this account, couldn't find it said any better than the way one commentator, Alec Moitier, puts it. And he says this. The point of this passage, the conclusion to be drawn is obvious. In the work of God, Mere human effort, however well-intentioned, committed, or influential, results in failure. The only way forward, speaking reverently, he says, is to mobilize God on our side. Seen in this light, chapter 2, 11 to 22, may be called the way of failure. And by contrast, Chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, brings us into the place of effectiveness. James Boyce puts it this way, Moses was in 40 years in Egypt learning to be something. He was in 40 years in the desert learning to be nothing. And he was 40 years in the wilderness proving God to be everything. It's fitting here as we close to consider how much this story resonates with the truth of Jesus Christ. Just consider that like Moses calling the Hebrews his brothers, so Jesus, according to Hebrews 2, called us brothers. Like Moses left his glory to be among us for the joy that was set before him, So Jesus left his glory with the Father to be among us for the joy that was set before him. Like Moses, when he came, he reached to the lowest of the low. So Jesus, when he came, said, I came for the sick, not the healthy. Like Moses was rejected, so Jesus was rejected. Like Moses leads us to freedom, led Israel to freedom, so Jesus came to lead us to freedom and to liberation as we partner with God. And let me close by asking, is that what you're doing right now? Are you living in the freedom and the liberation that Christ has purchased for you as you partner with God? This past week, I encountered one of the most difficult situations I personally have ever encountered. Seeking to minister to a dear, dear, dear one to my heart who has gone astray. And every step of the way, my heart was dealing with this text And the whole time I'm asking myself and and cautioning myself, do not, 
take this situation in your own hands. Do not take this in your own hands. You follow God at every moment. From beginning to end. The times you speak, the times you're silent. The times you participate, the times you withdraw. In every moment, you give the matter to God every step of the way. Because I know, because I've experienced Ben Love Lady's way too many times before and watched it fall flat on its face and me turning tail and run with my tail between my legs. We want God. We want God. In every situation, we want His solution. Amen? You wait for it. You walk with Him. You don't run ahead and you don't lag behind. You walk with God. And you watch Him deliver. And you be content to say that deliverance might not be in my lifetime. And that's okay. I won't put a stranglehold on it before I die. I'll let him do it his way. A lot of Israelites died before the Exodus. And don't think they didn't. You wait on the Lord. You walk with him. And he will deliver. And you'll see it from here or you'll see it from there. As he wills. But he will deliver. Amen? Amen. I'll ask your musicians to come. Please stand and let's sing together, Not in Me.